and just a few days ago it was reviewed by the Royal Society of Canada. Um, and that review is both uh, promising and disturbing. But basically, uh, microwave radiation in Safety Code 6 is based on a heating effect. So if it doesn't heat your body, it's not harmful. That's what Health Canada believes. So the only kind of damage we can get is from a heating effect. And we know that microwaves cause heating because we have microwave ovens, and we use that to heat our food. Our guidelines in Canada are 100 times less protective than guidelines in other countries. And that includes Russia, China, Italy, Switzerland. So we don't have nearly as protective guidelines in other countries. And I don't think the reason for that is that we are actually stronger than other nations. I think it's because we have poor guidelines. And this particular exposure guideline was based on military personnel because our first use of microwaves was for radar during World War II. And so we had to protect military personnel because they were the only ones exposed. We now use microwaves to heat our food, we use it to talk to people, we use it to get on the internet. This is all the equivalent of radar or microwave radiation. So our guidelines do not protect pregnant women, they do not protect infants. And according to Health Canada, as long as the levels are below guidelines, there are no adverse effects. That's what, that's what they will tell you. And that's like having a speed limit of 200 miles per hour, which is a very high limit. I don't think there's anything like that in Canada. Certainly in Germany, they don't have speed limits, so quite different country. But that's like saying, as long as you're driving less than 200 miles per hour, you can't have any accidents. That's the same thing that Health Canada is doing with their guideline. And the future right now does not look um, good. We are here and levels are increasing exponentially as we speak. And everyone is hiding behind Health Canada guidelines, whether it's the different wireless producers, uh, whether it's various forms of government, both provincial and municipal, and certainly the school system is. So when we go into a school and we try to explain to the principal or to the board of trustees um, or the board of governors, and we say, you don't want to have wireless technology in your school. Children are very, very sensitive. You need to protect them. Why don't you use internet access? They will say, well, it's not harmful because our levels are below safety code six in Canada. They don't realize those levels are to protect um, military personnel against heating. They have nothing to do with young children. Okay, so who enforces this? Well, uh, we have traffic safety, uh, the Ontario Ministry of Transport. We have the Ontario Provincial Police. We also have municipal police departments. So we have a lot of enforcement of traffic safety. And indeed, you can even call in if you see an impaired driver and let them know that someone's impaired and they will investigate because this is a serious offense. What about electrosmog exposure? Who's actually enforcing that? It comes under the jurisdiction of Industry Canada. Now, Industry Canada sells licenses to all the telecom producers. They are bringing billions of dollars into the Canadian government and they do not enforce anything. When they give you a license, they will ask the producer, what levels are you going to be emitting? They get the levels. Is it below safety code six? They say yes, and they say, thank you very much, you've got a permit. They don't go out and actually check to see what the levels of exposure are. So basically, we don't have anyone who's enforcing these exposures. As a matter of fact, there was a school um, near Collingwood, Ontario, where children were getting sick, they were complaining of heart palpitations and dizziness and headaches. And um, these, the parents got very concerned, they thought it was the Wi-Fi. They then, um, the school board agreed to bring in a private contractor to actually do some monitoring. And they found that at one of the computers, the levels exceeded safety code six. It was actually higher than safety code six. They tried to hide that in the report, but it was, it was still there. And Health Canada was approached and they were told, well, in this school, levels exceeded safety code six. And the response from Health Canada, this was the uh, director general of the radiation branch was, um, well, Health Canada is so protective, we build in an extra 50 times protection factor, so it doesn't actually matter if levels are exceed safety code six. So this is our, our federal government uh, protecting us. <coughs> So wireless is here to stay. What can we learn from some of these technologies to uh, 
keep us healthy. The second example I'd like to do, uh, talk about is tobacco. We all know smoking is bad. It originally started with a peace pipe, which I don't think is a bad way of smoking tobacco if you're trying to make peace with your, with your enemies. But we began to smoke and we began to do it excessively. And it's excessive smoking that causes the most amount of harm. And now we have problems with lung cancer and heart disease and many other types of illnesses related to smoking. We all recognize this. We all recognize that smoking is addictive. I think very few people, certainly in this audience, would, would you know, try to challenge that. What about cell phone and wireless technology? It's becoming addictive. You know, you try to take a cell phone away from someone and you know, they'll have a nervous breakdown in some cases. So one of the ways to figure out if you're a cell phone addict, I'm going to ask you um, to try to answer this question. Uh, how do you feel when you misplace your cell phone? Do you panic? Are you desperate? Are you sick? Are you relieved? Well, according to one study, okay, 73% panicked. 14% were desperate. 7% were sick. And 6% were relieved. So if you fell into this, you panicked, or you were desperate, um, chances are you're becoming an addict, or um, you're, you're, you are one already. Now, if I see two young girls smoking like this, and if I can stop myself from going up to them and not saying anything, uh, I just think, my God, they don't realize what they're doing to themselves. They won't be able to stop when they get older. Chances are they're going to have some illness related to their smoking, especially if they can't stop it. But what do we do when we see young people doing this? Just accept it, right? Yeah. If you saw someone, um, a mother, smoking in front of her infant, chances are you'd want to go up and say, hold on, secondhand smoke is harmful. But how often do we stop a mother who's got an infant in her hand and is talking on a cell phone? and saying that radiation might actually be affecting your infant. Doctors tell pregnant women not to smoke while they're pregnant. How many doctors tell pregnant women not to use their wireless technology? And I'm talking about more than cell phones. Having a Wi-Fi computer on your lap is probably worse than having a cell phone up to your head if you're pregnant. So you don't want to have the radiation close to the fetus. And we don't allow children to smoke but we allow this to happen, right? Now, Health Canada has done something good. They actually have a warning on their website recommending parents not to allow their children to use cell phones except for emergencies. So they have made that little step in the right direction. But as I said, we've got Wi-Fi in schools and we're exposing children to Wi-Fi for hours a day, not just a few minutes on a cell phone. So if anything, I think this is a much more serious concern. Children should not use cell phones except for emergencies, and they should definitely limit their use of Wi-Fi.